without further ado, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Maureen Hoke, and Maureen is going to share with us the HBR Whiteboard series. I think, Maureen, you can agree with me or, you know, tell me if I'm right in saying this was a very organic kind of homegrown project and I think bears all of the hallmarks of um, the best of work that's being done today in that it's so unique to your brand. Um, it was exactly what your audience was looking for and you took a great idea and you've evolved and grown it over the years. So we're, we're going to see a lot of different tenants of success today. Maureen, welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And I am excited to talk about uh, this topic, which is an important one for us here at HBR, and I'm sure for many of you listening right now, around how we use live video to engage people, and most importantly, how we engage a global audience. These are things we think about a lot here, and I'm so I'm excited to tell you a little bit about what we've learned around whiteboards. And I'm also really interested in hearing um, from those attending, I really want to hear about your experiences and um, and what you're doing in this space right now. But before we get to that, I'll give you just a little bit of background on um, HBR. So um, HBR is, is a cross-platform media organization. There's a magazine that comes out six times a year. There is a website, hbr.org, which I am the editor of. Uh, and then we also have a press operation, so we publish books. Uh, and our mission is is really pretty uh, basic in that we want to make management better and help you do your job better and we've uh and we do that through many different ways we do that through text content we do that through video we do that through audio we do that through social uh, and that's part of what makes it a really interesting job for me is because we are working across many different platforms and many different ways of telling stories uh, and one thing that's important to note sort of context wise is we do have a healthy social media following on facebook we're at, um, I think we're at around 3.4 million people who have liked the page. In all, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 million social media followers. Uh, and that is sort of an important piece of information to think about as we kind of go into, go into why we did this Facebook Live project. And it's also important to know that about half of our digital audience that comes to hbr.org is outside of the US. So for us, in terms of thinking about how to engage audiences where they are, um, finding a platform and social platforms are often very good for this, uh, where we could really connect with people directly was was very exciting. So um, I think you're seeing one of, you're seeing one of our most recent issues there in this GIF. Um, so I hope that you hope you check it out if you're inspired to after this. Um, a little bit about our video program. We have it, you know, it's it's a, what I like to say like a small but powerful video program here at HBR. Uh, we have one full-time video producer and then several other people who sort of are work on different video projects depending what they are. Some of those are people that work on live. Some of them are um, what you see here, which is these are more of the videos that we publish on HBR.org. So those take the form of explainers, you know. So we we actually take articles and turn them into animated explainers. We do charts and animation based on um, different content that already already exists in HBR. It's, you know, taking charts from magazines and, and different um, visualizations we may have done, turning those into video. And then we do have a pretty big backlog of just straight interviews with um, different authors and experts that have written for HBR.org. We do, um, and so just for, so we do a lot more explainers. We do a lot more charts and animations than we do interviews, which is part of what made Facebook Live sort of interesting for us because it was a chance for us to get experts back on the screen in a way that felt interesting, relevant, and useful. We, <clears throat> we started Facebook Live like a lot of other publishers in April 2016, um, we were at the time we were doing five videos a week. Um, we had a small team when we initially launched, and it's still pretty small. But we had a video producer, we had someone who moderated comments, and then we had sort of a QA person who was there to just help keep things moving and make sure that everything was was working correctly. And we tried several different approaches when we started on Facebook Live. Um, and one of the, th but the one that kept performing the best was this idea of a whiteboard. So a whiteboard, as you see, what you see on the left is um, an author for HBR. His name is Evan Bear. He did one of our, he did one of our very first whiteboards and one of our 
very successful whiteboards. Um, I know my video team would want me to say that this is when we just got started doing Facebook Live. We were shooting with a phone. You know, it was like when we were sort of like at our at our really getting started and really ramping up, um, and we've really improved our production quality since then. But this kind of shows you the process that we went through to figure out if somebody what's going to make someone actually stop on their facebook feed and spend a few minutes with us and learn something and what we learned was that really putting an expert having them in front of a whiteboard having them directly address the camera and explain an issue that you that they think is important for someone to understand that was the thing where we saw not only a lot of views but we also saw a lot of engagement you know we saw people interacting we saw people asking questions and um that was really so that whiteboard format an expert again in front of the camera in front of a whiteboard explaining a concept was really the one that we stayed with most consistently um, and not only did our audience like it but our experts and our authors liked it too it was a chance for them to really talk about what they know best and they really enjoyed the chance to interact with people as well um, so I, I always like to show though this this uh, one of our most our earliest attempts um, and what we found as part of that so fast forward from there to what we you know what we were learning as we we did these whiteboards and why we were doing them on facebook live um what we realized were, were a few things um we were reaching a global audience in real time i mean that was something that was very valuable to us that in other formats and other ways that you collect data as, as people who work on digital um you know some of that is coming to you um you know after the fact or you're looking at it in aggregate and this was a way for us to really connect with that audience in a real-time way um and really hear from them in their own in their own voices um we were very excited about giving people around the world access to these ideas so um as you'll see as our whiteboard program expanded you know we really had people you know from from all different types of universities all different types of consultants and business leaders who are sharing their ideas with people in ways that you might not often have access to um, that was very powerful from us from a mission perspective and again i find it was very motivating for the experts we had on camera as well um, and it also gave our uh, those contributors a way to interact directly with people that was very motivating for them um, I mean, Facebook built a very, very powerful platform for live streaming, and I, I think that's that's something that we certainly valued. And we, there is something when you're trying to figure out all the technical components of how to make a live stream successful. You know, having such a powerful platform that um, that was able to reach people in, in such an organic way was extremely powerful for us. But I do want to just take a minute with this part about Facebook's platform because, like a lot of publishers, we've been trying to figure out where is the right place to put um, where should we be putting our resources when it comes to video um, and where should and how much should uh, we be putting resources into Facebook versus other platforms I think in general most of us are looking to diversify and use several different platforms but I did want to see if you all could um, answer a poll question for me so bear with me while I while I pull it up but I'd love to hear from you all if are you um, using hold on one second are you using facebook for live streaming um and i'd let so i gave you many options here for answers so one of them would be yes it's uh it's our main channel for a video um yeah, yes but we still use other channels um some of you i'm wondering if you're using youtube are you using some homegrown system or are you using something else entirely um so i would love for you if you want to just click a button that's closest to your situ to your scenario. I would love to know how many of you are still using Facebook for live streaming. I'll just I'll just give the I'll just give the uh, I'll just give this a couple of just 30 more seconds to show up. Um, and I and I'll say while while people are answering this question that um, you know we tried many different sort of configurations as we went to improve our production quality on Facebook and how we were doing our our live streaming. Um, I'm going to show you some of that in a minute, but um, it was sort of exciting not only to kind of figure out how to use the Facebook platform, but also to figure out sort of the right types of equipment to use. Um, so I'm going to see if I can close this poll, see what we've got. So, okay, so 20% of you said, I'll share this, 20% said it's our main channel for live video. Interesting. Okay, 40% of you use YouTube. 
and 20% of you use something else entirely. This is fascinating for me because we are also sort of trying to figure out where, whether we should be doing some experiments on YouTube. So thank you so much for participating in that. I think this is really, really interesting. Um, and I hope some of these lessons are applicable for you no matter what, um, no matter where, no matter what you're, you're uh, doing. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep going here. Um, so what are some of the elements of a whiteboard? I'm going to walk you guys quickly through what uh, a typical process looked like. So um, the, you'll see two people on the screen here. One of them is um, Amy Jen Su on the left. She did a whiteboard for us called Managing the Workload of Being a Leader. So that's kind of a more of like a personal, sort of a personal type, uh, a personal type of um, Topic and then the, on the right is Professor Kareem Lakani from Harvard Business School. He did a very successful whiteboard for us called um, "How Does Blockchain Work?" And typically the process would be we'd reach out to the expert. Um, they, you know, we'd talk to them about a potential topic, um, and we'd usually encourage them to send us an outline of four or five points. Um, we found when we're doing these whiteboards, um, really having a sense of, you know really a handful of points that you really want someone to make is is really important and then um and then walking them through a few things and and when we think about this is where the audience will sort of come in um we encourage them to think about the people that they're speaking to even though they're actually speaking to a camera when they're doing the whiteboard um <laughs> that really thinking about the fact that it's a global audience on the other side of of that lens so you know that means making sure even though a lot of the whiteboards we're doing are here in boston in fact most of them are really thinking about the fact that you're explaining this to a group of people from all over the world and to be really open to the idea that they um, could have all different types of questions there are maybe many different ways that that context is relevant to them um, so this, so this was, these are just two examples of how, what the, what that looked like. And you can see some of the interaction that we would get. I mean, on, on a successful whiteboard, we could get anywhere, I'd say from 500 to 1,000 comments and anywhere from, you know, another 500 to 1,200 shares of the, of the live. So we feel like this direct, again, this direct engagement strategy was very successful in the context of a, of a Facebook uh, of a Facebook live but I think it could be successful on other platforms as well um, you know this really for us broadened out into a whole series of, of different videos this is just a few we've done more than a hundred whiteboards at this point and when we were considering like what makes a good whiteboard what's the criteria what's the right topic again we were really thinking about that global audience as well um, what were some of the topics that would be most relevant to people no matter where they were you know really trying to make sure that we weren't choosing topics that were too u.s centric that were too um that were sort of i don't know too specific to our local context or something that we were talking about things that would be that would be interesting on a global level um and again really nailing down that very specific idea or those or those two or three ideas that we wanted to get across um, Part of what we did at the start of every live is we asked people where they were watching from. And, you know, we were always just, you know, thrilled and amazed at the wide variety of engagement that we saw from really all different places around the world at any given point. And um, I also included some interesting comments here that we got on uh, a few different whiteboards. You know, the first one, the one from Japan was about a whiteboard we did about loneliness at work. Um, we did another piece, I think we did another whiteboard on emerging markets and corruption, which is where that Mexico comment from, comes from. Um, and the other one was just a nice comment we got from someone in Greece. So it's it, it was really remarkable how engaged people were, no matter where they were around the world, and um, how much they were interested in contributing, and, and how excited they were to be able to engage with these experts. Um, I think what we learned in the process of doing, going through this, this journey of, of doing more than 100 whiteboards now um, is that we did invest in, in our production quality. So that meant buying better cameras. It meant buying better mics. Um, it meant, you know, just investing in the, in the, the level of the level of a video we were producing. It didn't mean adding more people, but it did mean buying some better equipment. We found that was really worth it. And I think this is an important point when you're thinking about communicating with people with a global audience 
um, that we're not ever we're not everyone is a native English speaker, or even simple things like having very clear audio, or having the ability to put certain graphics on the screen that uh, can help reinforce really important points. Um, we really feel like this did help our engagement, and it also made it easier for us to reuse the content. So right now, if we do a, a whiteboard on Facebook we curate certain whiteboards and edit them down to a, somewhere between eight and 10 minutes in, in length and publish them on hbr.org. So for us, really investing in that production quality um, really paid a lot of dividends. And I think the other thing, like I mentioned earlier, is that experts like this format. Um, it's a good way for people to share their, their ideas. They get to see what resonates with a broad audience. Um, and there's even ways that they can follow up with people after, um, thanks to the comments section. And, you know, we would even see some small things like um, bumps in Amazon sales of books uh, after somebody had had participated. So there was a nice um, there was a nice effect of something that's really valuable to the audience, something that the experts really enjoyed, and something that we enjoyed producing, and that we were able to do with pretty lean resources. Um, and then we still have questions. And if any of you have answers to some of these questions or experiences, I'd really love to hear about it, which is um, how much does scheduling a live matter? So for any of you that use Facebook, you probably know that um, you have the ability to schedule something in advance and that sort of creates a, a post that people can follow. And while we, we, did, we definitely did that scheduling step um, and we tried, we experimented with different ways of letting people know in advance that lives were happening. We could never detect a big difference in the live audience that we were attracting. So um, that's sort of an open question that we still have. Um, how could we better ensure that others were sharing and amplifying the video in real time? So this is something I've heard from other Facebook Live broadcasters that one of the one of the best ways that they've seen of attracting a bigger live audience is really making sure that people were sharing the video while it was happening. We did get some of that organically, but I think we could have done more. Um, and then what is the value in resharing a live video? And again, I'd love to hear some of uh, what you think about this, but does is that an interesting experience for people? Do you have to edit down a live video for it to be um, interesting and useful if you can't ask questions or you can't engage in real time. And then I think in terms of Facebook in particular, figuring out where Facebook Watch fits in, that's one of Facebook's new initiatives to encourage longer form and episodic video. We do have a Facebook Watch channel called Whiteboard Sessions that we um, post to occasionally and we're, we are, like many others, trying to figure out where that fits into that wider strategy. Um, so before I get to takeaways, I, I just want to pause because I do see some questions here and I, I want to make sure that we get some time for that. Let me just see. So Sandy asks, how long did it take for a typical uh, digital initiative to pay off like the five weekly video series, either monetarily in terms of investment or in terms of its intended goal? That's a great question. So I would say that with with this particular, so like the five the five weekly video series, I would say that we weren't looking for um you know particularly a, a monetary re reward we have done i will say that we have done some attempts at monetization we have done a couple of whiteboards that were sponsored by an advertiser but we were never really focused i think on on a monetization play with this for us it was probably part r d it was part us learning how to do live video well and part of it, again, was really for us being able, the chance to engage with this audience really effectively. So I would say, when did we, it probably took us, I would say, probably two to three months before we really felt confident that whiteboards was something that we wanted to continue doing. Um, it's really hard to sometimes set goals when you're doing something that's brand new and you don't know exactly how how the audience is going to react. And also when you're doing something on a platform, like any social platform where you know your control over how many people can see it at any given time is limited. But I think if I if I base base it off of our Facebook Live experience and some of the ways that we treat other experiments here at HBR, I'd say usually three months is, is a runway that we give ourselves to determine if something's working. Um, let me just go to one more question. 
what has been the most surprising learning discovery about your audience as a result of these um, these real time touch points? So I think one of the most important things that we learned from being able to engage with people real time is that they had a real appetite for um, for engaging with this with this content in this way. So we weren't we weren't sure if there would be a lot of people watching and not engaging, not asking questions, not you know offering sort of thoughtful critiques. I think part of what we learned is that um, people uh, are very eager to learn and to understand these a lot of these really core business concepts, these core things about people at work. And no matter um, no matter what your context is around the world, that some of those issues are universal. So as much as you know, most of us struggle with things like time management, or most of us struggle with things like how to communicate with a boss. And I think there was a payoff for me in terms of opening editors' eyes as well to the fact that, again, you could think about your audience in the aggregate, but there is something so valuable about hearing from people directly about the challenges they have or the questions that they have. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the topics that we started to, we tried to do as many whiteboards on as we can was about, you know, you know, emerging markets, like emerging market strategies, startups in emerging markets. And some of that, you know, was based on some of the feedback that we saw from the audience. Um, and I also think it's just, it's always so valuable for editors to connect with their audience in real time, in a really personal way. It really helps ground you in, in what your audience cares about. I'm just gonna to go to this, this last question from Sandy. Thank you so much for these questions, Sandy. How are you handling CRM across all these platforms? So, I mean, I would say in terms of Facebook itself, you know, it's most of that data is really contained within Facebook and we're, we're, we look at that data and consider that data really within the context of that platform. Um, you know, of course we have a lot of different ways that we, we think about analytics across all of our different platforms and, um, what makes a person who's coming to us from social, what engages them differently than what somebody com who's coming from a newsletter or somebody who's coming direct directly from the site, um, what we can learn from those lessons. But I would say in the context of the whiteboards data, that was, we were really handling that strictly within the Facebook platform. Um, so if there aren't any other questions at the moment, hold on, Marissa has one more question. Um, can you give us more detail on how you increase uh, your production quality? Definitely. So when we started, we had like a lot of people, we were using a phone. I think we had a little mic that we plugged into the phone. Um, it was all, you know, we were really winging it. And we probably did that for the first, uh, the first couple of months, maybe at, at least. And one of the things that we learned as part of that, because there was often something that would go wrong or something that um, something we didn't expect, is that the audience will forgive you a lot of things. So they will forgive a problem with the picture, they'll forgive a problem with the graphics, but the thing they will not forgive you about is bad audio. Um, and that was that was one of the first places that we focused was we really had to get audio right. Um, so we we did invest in some wireless mics for for that, and we also you know upped our production quality with better cameras. We use a streaming service called Vidpresso, which also has some on-screen graphic uh, possibility you know um, capabilities that we use. Um, we did invest in a very uh, basic light kit. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else. You know, most most of it was really focusing on getting making the experience as consistent and reliable as possible. And the visual part of a whiteboard, it was also we think very important to what made it interesting for people on Facebook. Um, we really coached the people on camera to make sure that they were using the whiteboard space, that they were writing down their important points, even if they weren't the kind of people who were. Um, wanting to sort of draw a lot of charts and graphs on a whiteboard, just being able to have some visuals that that you can call the audience back to, that was very important. Um, with Vidpresso, there's a way that if somebody, if you're answering a viewer question, you can, um, you know, sort of put that question up on screen. We thought that was also a really nice, nice uh, way to engage people. So um, 
and you know that took but you know adding all these things particularly some of the streaming you know it takes a lot of testing our product manager and our video producer definitely put in a lot of time looking at different options um, making sure that we had the right equipment testing it so it does take some patience to do that but we feel like we feel like there was a good payoff on that um okay i'm going to talk through a few takeaways and then i'll let you know where our whiteboard program sits right now so these are some things that I think are helpful as it pertains to live video of all types, but that the audience values direct interaction. You know, they are eager to learn from you. And the more that you can figure out what your audience needs most from you or what they're most eager to take away, um, I think the better you can sort of experiment with that, with that video experience. Um, to say hello and ask people to share where they're watching from. This seems so simple, but it was really one of the best ways that we were able to get a sense of, of who our audience was and, and um, really get that feeling of, of it's really a global group of people um, who are interested in many different things. Um, having a simple plan for what you want the audience to do or learn. So as I mentioned earlier, when we had people, we have experts appear for a whiteboard we ask them to come up with an outline of four or five points that they really want to make and to really encourage them to, to make sure that they have a simple idea or a question that they're trying to answer and to not try to overcomplicate, not try to overcomplicate things. Um, remind on camera talent to consider the international audience. This was something we always made a point of making sure that our Facebook Live talent um, understood and remembered that they're really speaking to a global group of people and to not make um, their references or their, you know, even even little things like, you know, when they open a whiteboard, trying not to say good morning if it's morning where you are, or at least saying, well, good morning, it's morning here in Boston, uh, but wherever you are, you know, hope you're having a good day. Even small pieces of context like that, I think, were very helpful for the people appearing on camera. Um, responding to comments and questions, you know, a lot of our whiteboards are pretty long. Some, you know, some of them will go. 30 to 40 minutes and there's a lot of information to cover but making sure that you can respond to as many comments and questions as you can um, even thanking or liking people or liking questions that people ask and sometimes we would have our experts actually go back into the comments and respond to people um, not everyone may have time to do that but i think that is such a valuable form of engagement and is so so helpful so as much as you can make sure that um, you do you do something to thank people or do some follow up with people who ask questions um, super valuable and I think is really sort of exciting for the person on the other side and visuals help a lot I you know there's a lot of different ways that you can obviously incorporate videos into visual it was again like even just having someone write down points um, and help illustrate their ideas in the form of a whiteboard drawing we found to be really effective and really helpful and hopefully again helped that audience wherever they were follow follow the information and hopefully help gave them gave them something that they could walk away with having learned um, so that is that was the the, the trip through our whiteboards um, where we are right now with our whiteboard um, program is we are still doing some whiteboards on facebook live we've we've turned that number down to around one to two a month we still see you know a, a lot of value in connecting with a global audience on that platform and giving them um access to these experts i mean i, I think platforms like facebook are great way to try out some of these new experiments or these new things that you may be considering and it's a great way to get feedback from the audience quickly i think there's a lot of value in that um, we are putting shorter whiteboards on hbr.org and we are also starting to think about whether there might be a form of whiteboard that either could be just for hbr subscribers or whether we could be thinking about whiteboards on some other platforms as well uh, we feel like w this is a really nice combination of, um, of getting our experts to interact with the audience directly, and we're excited to kind of continue to grow it and see and see um, what some other experiments might help us learn. So um, from there, I will go to your questions. <laughs> Do you? Uh, let's see what questions we have. Thank you so much um, for all these great questions as well. Let's see, Patty. 
Um, have marketers, advertisers participated as as experts? No. Uh, you know, we did have a like I said, we did. I think I think it was last fall. We had a couple of um, whiteboards who that who were sponsored by an advertiser, but the the people that would appear as a whiteboard um, that would sort of have to fit our normal editorial criteria. So those were mostly academics. Um, some consultants who have written for HBR, um, some business leaders. And, you know, at the very beginning of when we were doing whiteboards, we were also doing things like we had an advice column, we would do interviews. We found a lot less engagement around those topics, which is why we really shifted the focus just to whiteboards. But um, yes, we did. We wouldn't, we did not have any advertisers appear in that way. And then Amy asked, what's your criteria for deciding which experts and topics to feature on the Facebook Live format? That's a that's a good question. And it also relates to the idea that we, we are focusing on and thinking about a global audience. I would say we were always looking for a mix between um, what we call, what we would think of as what we call here at HBR, something called managing yourself. So that means uh, topics that help you work better. So those could be things like managing your workload. It could be things like um, how to work mindfulness into your day. Um, it could be things, a lot of things around time management, those very universal topics. Um, and then, you know, in, and even very, very practical things like some of the best ways we did a workshop on resume writing, some things like that that are, are really um, universally interesting and, and we feel like there's a really good appetite for, um, always an appetite for, for getting better at those things. And then I would say, we were trying to either help explain um, really important topics in business, or we were trying to think about um, thinking about that Facebook audience. What are some of the topics or company level topics that would be most engaging and um, and interesting to them? So some of those topics would be things like that blockchain video I showed I showed earlier. That was a very popular one. We've done things again on emerging markets, on manufacturing. Um, on AI and technology. Surprisingly, we've done some really great whiteboards on AI and technology, but um, those didn't always attract the biggest live audience for us at the time, which was always a surprise. I think we're going to keep looking for the right angle. But I think a good way to think about how we thought about topics was, is there really compelling question that we think we can answer for people? And can we do that in a way that's, um, that feels very accessible and relevant and the kind of thing you'd want to ask questions about? Um, just going to see if there are any other questions. Do you make money? No. So do we, so the question is, do you make money at all off of Facebook Live? And um, no, aside from the, we, the, the advertising revenue that we did uh, get last year, um, we really see this as, you know, really one of the extensions of our video program. And we do see it as a way to create some very valuable con um, content. And we also know that our experts, again, really like the reach of Facebook and it's an effective way for them to, to reach a bigger audience, but we don't, we don't have a monetization strategy around it. Um, yes. Maureen, I have a question. This is the kind of project that really involves a lot of different people across your organization from its inception. So is there anything about, um, you know, program incubation or stepping across the aisle um, to engage colleagues in new ways that you've learned through the Facebook Live program that, you know, either our audience could learn from or you're using now in future programs? What's the internal process? Right. I think, so I think one of the things we had to sort of be okay with is, is trying something that was completely new. And while there's a lot of things you can prepare for, uh, especially when you're doing live video, you have to be able to, um, you have to just be able to know that sometimes things won't go perfectly. So when it came to our internal process, and even as we were kind of um, working, so the people involved, let's say it's our video team and our product team, um, and then editors who would be involved in these videos, um, I think everyone had to kind of understand that this can be a stressful, it can be stressful doing a live video and if something doesn't go right or somebody's mic falls off or something weird happens, that like we're all going to be okay, um, that when and when we're in that room, um, again, having different people there from different parts of the organization, really trying to make sure that we had roles clearly defined. So um, I'll give you an example of that. So if we're in the middle of it, we, we decided that, um, one of the roles in a live is there's a comment moderator. So that is the person who's reading the comments and is asking the experts questions. 
we decided that if something goes awry, if there's a problem with the video, if something, something strange happens, that that comment moderator would be completely focused on the expert. Okay, so, so for example, let's say something goes wrong and we have to stop the video and restart, which is very uncommon, but you know, instead of that person turning to us or talking to other people, that person would just be focused on explaining to the expert what was happening and kind of helping, helping just keep, make them understand and make them feel comfortable. So I think in those situations when, when you are pulling people in who either don't work together often or who have to, and who have to deal with sort of a stressful environment, having roles clearly defined and then, um, and then making sure that you are sharing things that went well and didn't go well afterwards those things i think were very valuable for us i think we're really fortunate here that we got a lot of runway to try this and um and that's a one of the really great things really about working at hbr is that there is this culture of experimentation where there wasn't a lot of um there wasn't a lot of sort of management of what every single video was going to be that was really up to the team that was doing it um you know and i i think that in that way when you can give a small team like that a lot of room to try things, learn what works, learn what doesn't, and there isn't a huge penalty for um, something going wrong that you can't control, like a technical issue, um, that I think is a really nice recipe for success when you're doing something brand new. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else, but I, I think those, those are some of the things that I'd highlight. And just a little bit about length of video. That surprised me. Uh, I mm -hmm. think that those you know, perhaps longer, 30 to 40 minutes are perhaps longer than people are used to um, asking their audience to sit for. Did you test other time durations or how has, the, how has that um, aspect of the videos evolved? Definitely. And it's funny, when we started doing these videos, um, I think the requirement was that they be at least 10 minutes long. And I remember we were all panicking how are we going to do 10 minutes? You know, meanwhile, fast forward a year and it's like we're telling people to cut it off after 45. So what we found were that, you know, in order for um, in order for some of our experts to be able to adequately explain their ideas, they needed some time, you know. So if if we take so, for example, one of our very successful video for us was how to manage the workload of being a leader. So that expert usually needed around 15 minutes at least to actually walk through their idea, make those, you know, three to four points that I mentioned that we would really try to focus them on at the beginning, um, you know, sometimes offer some examples. And we found that, you know, people enjoyed listening to that. You know, we, we were wondering, and of course, there's always some churn when a live is actually happening. But we found that people enjoyed that. And we also thought that that was really good content for us if we wanted to be able to reuse it, that we wouldn't have just a super quick, super short abbreviated version of that explanation, but you'd really get the in-depth explanation of that of that topic. And then usually we needed, you know, around 15 or so minutes for um, some Q&A. And some of that, you know, a, a lot of that was coming from the audience. And then sometimes our own editors might have some questions. I will also add that um, we did find that sometimes the audience needed a little bit of encouragement when it came to questions. So, you know, if there was a time um, when there was a really great topic and we could see people watching and we could see, you know, and, and people were telling us where they were watching from, but we weren't getting questions. You know, sometimes I would jump in with a question. It was sort of this, this, this strange effect of like, as soon as somebody else asks a question, everybody else um, feels encouraged to put their question for, forth. So it's, a, it's sort of another part of supporting a video like this that you kind of have to be willing to, to kind of encourage the audience to participate. Um, but yeah, that, that's really the link that we found um, was useful to the audience and again, gave us good material that we could reuse. Um, and, you know, um, maybe it also encouraged more shares if, you know, the, as, a, as opposed to a, a really shorter video where you have less opportunity to share and comment perhaps doing those longer videos helps helps encourage that as well. Um, but the, yeah, that, that has been that has been our experience. I think now that, you know, it's, it's sort of an interesting point though, that with, as we start to experiment with whiteboards in different ways and on different platforms, um, that we might need to start cutting that time back and trying them at some different lengths. So I'll keep you posted if, if we try that. All right, we'll keep an eye on that. I, um, I wanna thank you in the spirit of great content, keeping people engaged. Um, I want to thank you for 
participating today. It was really terrific. I think we all learned a lot. Um, not only did you um, experiment with a new platform and um, find a new value for your audience, but in the process, it seems like you've really built a really valuable brand extension that has all sorts of possibility for the future. So that's exactly what we like to hear. And um, I want to thank our audience for joining us today and for joining us these four weeks. Um, the Imagination Awards uh, will, will do their call for entry next January, so start thinking of your great projects now. And in the meantime, um, Maureen and your colleagues at Harvard Business Review, we want to thank you for your great work. Um, very impressive, and we appreciate you sharing it with us today. Thank you. It was a real pleasure to be here. And thanks for the great questions. Yeah, so we'll sign off. Everyone have a great final few weeks of summer and uh, look for our next program at the on the other side of Labor Day. Take care, everyone.